We're on page 273. We're going to talk about respiratory physiology. First, I'd like to begin by giving you the overall process. Looking at this picture, we can see uh, five numbers identified here. These five numbers correspond to the numbers that we've listed in your outline. So the first number is right here, and we see arrows. This simply indicates in goes the good air, out goes the bad air. This process of moving air in and out of your lungs is called pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation is simply the movement of air between the atmosphere and the alveoli of your lungs, as we will be explaining, this involves changes in pressure inside your lungs. We will be learning that when your pressure in your lungs, your alveolar pressure decreases, that creates a suction to draw air in. And when the alveolar pressure rises, increases, it blows the air out. The next number we see is a number two. Right by the number two, it shows arrows indicating that carbon dioxide is diffusing out of the bloodstream into the lungs, and simultaneously oxygen is diffusing from the lungs into the bloodstream. So this exchange of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide gases, is shown right here. This occurs between the bloodstream, the pulmonary capillaries, and the lungs, the alveoli of the lungs. Anytime we talk about diffusion, diffusion involves a concentration gradient. So what is making carbon dioxide flow into the lungs and what is causing oxygen to flow out of the lungs are differences in concentration gradients between the bloodstream and the alveoli. Now, what is shown next, number three, is that this oxygenated blood is then being pumped by the heart through the blood vessels of the body. So the oxygen is being distributed. So here, number three, distribution of gases in the blood, the movement of blood through the blood vessels, and of course, what is causing that blood to flow is a blood pressure created by the pumping action of the heart. What we see next over here, number four, is we've indicated that oxygen will diffuse out of the capillaries of the bloodstream, uh, first to the tissue fluid and then into the cells, and simultaneously carbon dioxide will be diffusing out of the cells into the tissue fluid and from the tissue fluid into the bloodstream, into the capillaries of the bloodstream. So again, we have an exchange of gases between the bloodstream and the tissue cells. So that's what we wrote. The movement of gases between the capillaries and the tissues, again, involves differences in concentration of those gases, of the oxygen and carbon dioxide between the bloodstream and the tissue cells. Finally, number five, it's uh, five is circled right here by the cells. And we need to remind ourselves, why do cells even require oxygen and where does carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, where does it come from? The answer to that is cellular respiration. Cellular respiration or internal respiration is the process of breaking apart foods such as sugars and fats with oxygen in order to produce ATP. So we have divided the overall process into five steps. And of course, we've already learned extensively about cellular respiration. On the next page, well, on page 274, all that I've tried to indicate here is how much oxygen we consume each minute. I am not going to test you on these numbers. But just as a point of understanding how much it can vary, at rest, we typically consume about 200 milliliters of oxygen in cellular respiration in the cells of our body every minute. Now, during strenuous, vigorous exercise, when our metabolic rate speeds up, the rate of cellular respiration speeds up, we may be using up 4,000 milliliters of oxygen each minute in cellular respiration. So we just wanted to impress upon you how much it can vary. Now, what I've presented next is a review of the anatomy of the respiratory system. And I will go through this briefly for a more extensive review 
I would refer you to my vi anatomy videos on the respiratory system. We commonly divide the respiratory system into a so-called upper respiratory system and lower respiratory system. The upper respiratory system includes the nasal cavities, uh, the throat or pharynx, and the uh, larynx. The lower respiratory system consists of the trachea and the bronchi and bronchioles and alveoli of the lungs. Preferentially, air should be inhaled through the nose. Some, some of us are mouth breathers and we inhale air through our mouth. If the air enters our nose, it goes through the nasal cavities, and then from the nasal cavities, it travels down our throat or pharynx. If we inhale air through our mouth, it goes through our oral cavity and then enters our uh, pharynx or throat. Now here I've just summarized how air would be inhaled through our nasal cavities and enters the upper part of our throat called the nasopharynx. If we inhale air through our mouth, it enters our oral cavity, and from our oral cavity, it enters the middle part of our throat called the oropharynx. When we look at the throat or pharynx, there's the upper nasopharynx, the middle oropharynx, and the lower laryngopharynx. Now, branching off the laryngopharynx are actually two passageways. One passageway is for food, where food would go from the laryngopharynx down the esophagus to the stomach. We're not dealing with that right now. But air would flow from the laryngopharynx through an opening called the laryngeal aperture. The word aperture means opening. And this is an opening that allows the air to flow into the larynx or voice box. The air flows right between your vocal cords through a slit. The air flows right through a slit called the glottis slit between your vocal cords. And then the air would flow down the trachea through the bronchi, and the bronchi subdivide repeatedly over and over again to smaller and smaller uh, tubes, eventually reaching very small tubes called bronchioles or bronchioles, which finally subdivide into alveolar ducts and terminate in, in air sacs or alveoli. This is a picture on page 276. Uh, we can see how the air would flow uh, from the, through the throat or pharynx, through the larynx, down the trachea. The trachea bifurcates or splits into two branches, a right and a left uh, primary bronchus. The primary bronchus subdivides into lobar bronchi. The right lung, as you learned in anatomy, has three lobes, and the left lung has only two lobes. So there are three lobar bronchi in the right lung and two lobar bronchi in the left lung. These uh, bro lobar bronchi subdivide, again, repeatedly over and over into smaller and smaller branches, culminating in the formation of bronchioles, and the bronchioles subdivide into alveolar ducts, and the alveolar ducts terminate as air sacs or alveoli. Surrounding the alveoli or air sacs is a profuse network of pulmonary capillaries. And this is where the exchange of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, is going to occur. The only place where oxygen can enter the bloodstream or carbon dioxide can leave the bloodstream is at the microscopic level of the uh, alveoli and pulmonary capillaries. No oxygen can go from your throat or your trachea into the bloodstream. The only place where oxygen can enter the bloodstream is at the level of the alveoli. This is page uh, 277. And we've written that with each subdivision of the airways, as they go subdivide into smaller and smaller and smaller airways, there are three histological changes that occur in the walls of these airways. The smaller the airway, the less cartilage found in the wall. In other words, your trachea, a large airway, has a lot of cartilage. You can feel it. And that's to prevent it from collapsing. As we go to smaller and smaller airways, such as the tiny bronchioles, they have very little cartilage in their walls. And therefore, they are prone to collapse because they are not reinforced with hyaline cartilage. A second histological change, as we go from one airway to a smaller and smaller airway, there's more visceral smooth muscle and less elastic connective tissue. 
Let me address elastic connective tissue first. The uh, trachea is a large airway. It does not have very much elastic connective tissue, and as a result, it is quite rigid. The trachea is rigid. It is not flexible. As we go to smaller and smaller airways, they have progressively more elastic connective tissue in their walls and become progressively more and more flexible or elastic. Regarding the visceral smooth muscle, as we go to smaller and smaller airways, there is progressively more visceral smooth muscle, just as there's more elastic connective tissue. The trachea has very little visceral smooth muscle. Therefore, it cannot really contract and constrict or relax and dilate. The trachea remains more or less the same diameter or width all the time. But as we go to smaller and smaller airways, they have visceral smooth muscle in their walls. It is innervated by autonomic motor neurons, parasympathetic and sympathetic, that can cause the visceral smooth muscle to contract or relax resulting in a change in the diameter of those bronchioles. When the visceral smooth muscle relaxes, that causes bronchodilation, and the airway gets wider and increases airflow. When the visceral smooth muscle in the walls of the bronchioles contracts, that causes the airway to narrow, to become constricted, causing a decrease in airflow. Now, uh, under alveoli, we indicated that alveoli are very, very, they are microscopically small and very delicate. The wall of an alveolus is one cell layer thick, made up of simple squamous epithelium. You have about 300 million alveoli or air sacs in each, each lung. Now, if you were to take all these air sacs, even though they're each individually microscopically small, if you could stitch them together into a big quilt made up of a total of 600 million alveoli, they would create a surface area of, of 760 square feet. That is 40 times the surface area of the skin on your body. So even though individual alveoli are small, we have so many of them, a total of 600 million in our two lungs, that collectively they form a huge surface where gases can be exchanged with the bloodstream. This is commonly known as the air-blood boundary or barrier. Now, there are specialized cells in the lungs I want to mention. There are what are known as type 2 alveolar cells or septal cells. They secrete a chemical called pulmonary surfactant. And the purpose of pulmonary surfactant is to prevent these microscopically small alveoli from collapsing. Pulmonary surfactant chemically is a phospholipoprotein, which simply means a protein with a phospholipid attached to it. And it acts to reduce surface tension and uh, allow these alveoli to remain open and prevent them from collapsing. In addition, inside our lungs are macrophages, large phagocytic cells designed to swallow up bacteria and viral particles, as well as dust and particulates, in order to keep our lungs, our airways clean. Now, the alveoli begin to develop in the sixth fetal month of development. The, per the point of that is that when babies are born premature, early, the most common problem they experience are respiratory or breathing problems because the lungs are the last organ to become functional, with the alveoli only just beginning to start to form, beginning with the sixth uh, month of fetal development. This is page 278. What we're looking at is a cross-section through uh, an alveolus or air sac. We can see that the wall of this alveolus is one cell layer thick, simple squamous epithelium. We also see in cross-sectional view uh, several pulmonary capillaries. Inside the pulmonary capillaries are red blood cells and uh, fluid called plasma. It is uh, here where the oxygen will diffuse across the alveolar wall through tissue fluid and then across the wall of the capillary into the bloodstream. And at the same time, carbon dioxide is diffusing in the reverse direction. 
You'll notice this area right here is boxed in. Let's magnify it. And if we magnify it, here we can see a magnified view. This is the uh, wall of the alveolus or air sac made up of simple squamous epithelium. In between, I've, sh uh, I've colored it yellow, but this would be the tissue fluid. And here is the wall of the capillary, also one cell layer thick of simple squamous epithelium. And uh, here are the red blood cells. So this is where oxygen diffuses across the alveolar wall, the tissue fluid, the capillary wall into the bloodstream. Most of the oxygen entering the bloodstream will then diffuse into the red blood cells or erythrocytes. Simultaneously, carbon dioxide diffusing out of the bloodstream will diffuse in the reverse direction. All of this is summarized right here. When a patient develops pulmonary edema, edema we know is a buildup of tissue fluid, in this case in the lungs. Most of us are thinking, okay, so the fluid is inside the alveoli, but in fact, where most of that fluid is accumulating is right in this space right here between the wall of the alveolus and the capillary wall. As more and more fluid accumulates right between the alveolus and the capillary, it, it creates a wider and wider distance between the two, and that slows down the rate of diffusion of oxygen from the alveolus into the capillary and the diffusion of carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream into the alveolus. So the result of pulmonary edema is that it interferes with this exchange of gases between the lungs and the bloodstream. 